Good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you are joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Rachel Starbuck from the Business Review and I will be your host. I'd like to welcome you to our new webinar platform. You'll notice that this webinar is browser based, so if you disconnect, please click on the link that you received via email to rejoin. In order to ask questions, you can send them in via the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen, or please use the top left hand box. We will allocate around 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session to address any questions or thoughts that you may have. If you click on the green resource list widget, there is a PDF to view or download from our speakers. We also have a short survey for you to fill out, which can be found in the red survey widget, all will be available at the end of the webinar. Please use the help widget if you require any assistance. So it is our pleasure to have LTS Lohman Therapy Systems with us today, who will be discussing transdermal drug delivery. Is it feasible for your drug? Today's guest speakers are Dr. Peter Klaffenbach, Head of Pharmaceutical Development, and Dr. Irish Snitchler, Marketing and Sales Intelligence. So without further ado, please allow me to welcome Iris. Hello everyone. Let's get started with today's webinar. Since this is the first webinar of LTS, I think it would be of interest to you to start with a short introduction of our company. This year LTS celebrates its 30th anniversary and we would like to present some highlights of a remarkable success story to you. In particular, we would like to talk about our first and most important technology platform, the transdermal system. In 1984, the company started its operations with a rather limited product portfolio. Ever since these beginnings, LTS has grown significantly to become the global market leader for the manufacture of transdermal systems. In 2013, we manufactured more than 850 million systems at our two sites, our headquarters in Andernach, Germany, and in the U.S. in West Corwin, New Jersey, generating sales of about 300 million euros. Today, LTS employs around 1,200 people with more than 150 working in development. Currently, LTS is engaged in more than 30 cooperation projects. LTS offers transdermal patches for a number of indications, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, pain treatment, smoking cessation, and various hormone products. LTS perceives itself as a full-service partner for the pharmaceutical industry, offering all services from feasibility studies to commercial manufacturer for global supply. I now hand over the microphone to Peter for the scientific part of this presentation. Thanks, Iris, and a very warm welcome from the R&D side. Um, I'd like first to share with you a quick overview on the topics that we are going to discuss within the next uh, about 40 minutes. So we talk about TTS designs and their advantages. So both from a pharmacological point of view and also from a patient point of view. Uh, I'd like to share with you some of the TTS designs and the advantages that we are currently uh, producing. And then, of course, it's interesting to talk about the TTS and the APIs. So how, did we, how do we do the assessment of APIs for feasibility in transdermal dosage forms? How do we do practical studies and feasibility of that? And I'd like to talk a little bit about the in vitro models that we use. And last but not least, I'd like to share with you some of the success stories in the TTS market with case studies and some market figures. And at the end, as Rachel already mentioned, uh, we will have a discussion and uh, you will have the opportunity to uh, answer some, uh, ask some questions. But before we really start, I'd like to hand over to Rachel for a quick poll. Thank you very much. So please select the answer that is relevant to you and then click Submit. So for today's first polling question, do you or does your company have any experience in controlled drug delivery technologies? If yes, what is the route of administration? And your answers are from A, yes, transdermal, B, yes, transmucosal, C, yes, oral, 
D, yes, others, or E, no. Please submit your answers now. So what are you expecting from this question? Well, um, I would believe that we will see uh, uh, mainly yes on the on the oral, because this is uh, what most people use. But um, maybe we also have a different audience that is particularly interested in uh, transdermal and transmucosa. We'll see. Okay then. So yes, transdermal seems to have been in the lead with 59%. Are these interesting results for you? Yeah, I mean it, it shows that that the audience is really. Uh, on the on the TTS um, pathway, and uh, I look forward to present uh, hopefully some interesting um, insights into that um, dosage form to the audience. Okay, let's talk about the true alternative, as we named it, the transdermal therapeutic systems. The TTS can deliver active pharmaceutical substance directly to the skin. And depending on the properties, the substance can then either act topically or systemically. And unlike other drug delivery systems, TTS also allow for precise delivery over extended periods of time. And TTS may also minimize or even completely eliminate side effects. And we have a closer look into those features within the next few minutes. So let's take a look into TTS from a pharmacological side first. What advantages do we have here? They show no first pass effect. Well, what that means, we take a close look onto that in a few minutes. The active substance do not pass through the gastrointestinal tract, so we don't have any impact on the GI tract, and so GI-related side effects can be reduced or even completely eliminated. We provide constant plasma levels, meaning that we don't have peak trust fluctuations. And unlike the conventional dosage forms and injectables, where you have a fast onset and a high C-max with potentially side effects caused by that, and then you have the sharp drop and, again, potential lack of efficacy later on. So that's something we can avoid here. They are ideal for active substances with a narrow therapeutic index window because the plasma level will remain within therapeutically effective window all over the time. We can effectively compensate for short drug half-life. So we replenish all the API that is metabolized without any user action. It's pharmacokinetically similar to continuous intravenous infusion, but of course it's not invasive and can be self-applied by the patient. The dosages can be adjusted easily by changing the size of the active area of the patch. And that's an important feature for pharma companies because it really simplifies the development. And last but not least, you have excellent control over the excess substance release, so we can really make a tailored release profile. From a patient side of view, there are some aspects, and probably most important, it's, it's not invasive. Uh, so we have no needles, no needle phobia, we have no swallowing of bulk tablets. The TTS duration of action can be up to seven days. So that means stick and forget for up to one week. There's a potential of fewer side effects. We talked about that already, and we have a, show, a closer look on that later on. Uh, there's the uh, potential of a quick discontinuation of the drug delivery in the event of an adverse uh, drug reaction. Uh, for example, when you take an antihypertensive uh, and you have hypotonic episodes. Well, that's something that's very unique to this dosage form. You can't do with any other dosage form. TTS are a suitable instrument for improved compliance. It helps patients to adhere to the medication. So it's improved treatment, improved efficacy, and also improved economics. And it can be used very easily and discreetly. The improved bioavailability and fewer side effects. So first of all, when we talk a look into only administered substances, they must pass through the liver before they can enter the bloodstream and are distributed to the body. This process can eliminate up to 99% of an active substance. TTS, on the other hand, deliver drugs directly to the skin, thereby bypassing the gastrointestinal tract. 
And the CDS technology really avoids first pass effects since the active substance enters the bloodstream directly to the skin, and we see that on the next slide in, a, in more detail. It helps to reduce side effects by reducing the peak trust ratio, by eliminating the GI pass, and also by limiting the dose to that amount that is really needed. And it reduces the active substance needed to achieve the same level or even better effect compared to conventionals, and that means there's less burden to the body. Next slide, I would show, like to share with you a typical example on, um, on the side effects. So let's take a look at the oxybutynin, which is a very famous compound, and the most common adverse drug reaction is dry mouth, which is caused by the n desmetyl oxybutynin metabolite, short, uh, short form DO. And so let's take a few minutes to view the slide. So on the right, you see the typical plasma over time profile from a conventional oral extended release form. What you can see is with the uh, black, um, the black marks rather low. This is oxybutynin, and uh, the, the 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 white hollow circles is the DO, the metabolites. So we do have relatively constant plasma levels, but the metabolite is approximately five times higher than the oxybutynin. And keep in mind, it is the metabolite that's really responsible for the for the dry mouth effect. On the left, you have the typical plasma profile from a transdermal patch. So you have just one application for uh, four days. And although you see also some of the metabolite is appearing, it's roughly the, the same um, amount of, of excess substance compared to the metabolite. So the ratio between metabolite and and the active substance is much better. So maybe you ask yourself why this, the metabolite shows up anyway. Uh, you should avoid first pass metabolism. That's true, but eventually every blood will pass through the liver uh, while it's circulating through the body. So the, the, the blood will pass through the liver and you will see some metabolism, but uh, of course it's much lower compared to the oral form. So on the next slide, we take a look into the various TTS designs, the features and advantages that we can today commercially manufacture as LTS. So first, this may seem to be familiar to most of you, the monolithic matrix TTS, which is the very simple and convincing design. The most important advantage is it's a very simple design the active substance is embedded directly into the adhesive. You can uh, obtain a controlled and constant even release of the API. It's a preferred design for favorable cost-benefit ratio. The second option that we do is a multi-layer matrix TDS that um, gives precise dosage even with large quantities of active substance. And here you have a distinct feature of several layers containing active substances that can be combined, either using different concentration or all the same concentration. You can achieve a high drug cooling effect, or you can modulate the specific delivery profile, or it's also possible you have a drug-free skin layer for optimized adhesion. There's also the reservoir matrix TTS, as we call it, that um, can be used for volatile or thermolabile compounds. And it's very suitable for, for those compounds because you don't need to pass through the drying tunnel on that. And it also gives you a very effective uh, active substance utilization. And with this design, you may also employ a rate controlling membrane, depending on the specific properties of the API. Then there's a matrix TTS with the overlapping backing layer, and that is underlined here as high efficiency. Um, this design is very important in case of very expensive active substance. Why is that? Well, usually you use a, a die cutting process of, for the manufacturing of TTS, and that reduces lots of waste uh, as you have a web that's remaining after die cutting. 
For this process here, we use a slitting process, which gives you optimum yield here. It's also particularly suitable for the use of less stable APIs that can only be combined with a limited number of adhesives. So the, the cover patch gives you excellent adhesion, and you don't need to uh, achieve the adhesion just by the API itself, by the adhesive itself. The micro reservoir matrix CTS, well, that's subtitled with enhanced thermodynamics. Dynamics. So what does that mean? Here we have the API dispersed in the polymer layer. And in situ, meaning while the patch is worn, we generate a hypersaturated system. So that gives us best thermodynamic um, delivery, yet we have a stable patch during shelf life. And it also gives us best substance utilization. And just to share some numbers with you, uh, the fentanyl patch that, uh, that we have uh, with that design, our metrophane, that contains only 2.75 milligrams of active substance. The same, uh, the same dosage from the originator contains 4.2 milligram API. So this, this, uh, the form uh, produced by LTS contains just 35% less API. So that's, I think, an important number. Then there's the design with a rate controlling membrane. Um, this is something um, we sometimes need for an extremely accurate active substance release. And the, the distinct advantage is that we have uh, an ideal system for highly potent active substance with a narrow therapeutic range. And you have a totally div uh, different release profile compared to conventional uh, TTS because the release is no longer contained by the, controlled by the adhesive but by the rate controlling membrane. It's therefore mainly used for those compounds that readily penetrate the skin. So let's talk a, lot, a little bit about uh, TTS and active substance. So which active substance can be delivered with TTS? Well, here we can offer you the development expertise of the market leader. And that means that we have a very rapid evaluation of active substances, sometimes also called paper assessment or paper feasibility. And then there's the true feasibility phase with a practical confirmation of the results generated in the paper assessment. So first of all, take a look into the theoretical phase. It's a, it's a unique approach First of all, we have a harmonized list of predefined parameters consisting of physical and chemical parameters like molecular weight and melting point, but of course pharmacological parameters like half-life time and also the, uh, the, the effective dose are also important. So maybe you don't have all parameters um, available uh, initially. That's okay, because we don't need all parameters um, for, for an assessment. But of course, the more you know about the compound, the more accurate the feasibility assessment can, can be. And then there's a fact known to everyone is that not every parameter is equally important. And based on, on our long-term experience of over 30 years, uh, we have uh, a, a weighing system of those parameters, weighing the important parameters heavier, compared to the less important. And then, even if based on the chemical and uh, physical characteristics of a compound, a compound may be suitable for transdermal delivery, there are certain knockout criteria. For example, if you have a product that needs liver activation, then that may be delivered transdermally, but of course it wouldn't make sense. So that's important to identify those knockout criteria. And then, that's probably something that's very unique to the RTS model. We have a single number as a benchmark of TTS feasibility, and it no longer depends on the, on the individual person making this assessment. So this, this system creates a kind of uh, unified um, evaluation that will give similar results uh, every time uh, you enter the same information, and not, not only depends on the experience of the individual that performs that evaluation. 
So once we determine that a, a compound may be uh, feasible for transdermal application and we move into the practical phase, we take, of course, then flux measurement from various TTS polymers. And that, again, is, is probably unique to LTS because we can offer to our clients the complete range of adhesives from acrylates to polyisobutylene to SIS and also silicones. So we can use the adhesive that is best suited for the API. And of course, sometimes you do need enhancers to get enough material through the skin. So there's an extensive list of potential enhancers that can, can be screened. And using the best formulation, of course, then human skin permeation would be performed in order to confirm that. All this activity needs to be backed by suitable analytical methods, which are developed in-house by the colleagues from analytical development. And they would, of course, do step stability studies in order to make an assessment how that formulation performs in terms of stability. And that also includes then the evaluation of suitable components like backing, release liner, and of course the primary packaging material. So what can you expect as a result of that practical phase? First and most important, we can give you a good estimation of the likelihood of a successful transdermal patch development. And you get a proposal for the TTS development program, including activities, timelines, and costs. We will make a selection of TTS candidate formulations for preclinical studies. And of course, we can manufacture those TTS candidate formulations for non-GMP preclinical studies. Sometimes we also use a different approach, and that very often applies to new chemical entities because those substances um, have a different uh, scenario. The theoretical phase, of course, is very similar to the conventional uh, paper feasibility based on the physical chemical parameters and the pharmacological parameters to make the feasibility assessment. But when it goes to the practical phase, there's a, a focus on generating quick results yet still using a limited amount of API, because most often at that stage, only very few uh, milligrams of API is available. And the focus here is to evaluate the feasibility very quickly during early substance development prior to making any further decisions on the uh, candidate. So during every practical phase, the in vitro studies are of utmost importance because uh, despite all the theoretical knowledge that we have, um, skin permeation is the most important tool in the development. And here at LDS, we have a very broad range of um, in vitro models available. And maybe on top of the list, because most important, this is human epidermis. Um, which is, of course, the highest relevance to the in vivo situation. But human epidermis also has certain disadvantages, like limited supply and also a certain variability. So therefore, there are a number of animal models that are currently used. And depending on the stage of development and the specific uh, aim of a study, we can choose from either cow udder or pig ear or guinea pig or hairless rat or hairless mouse skin. So depending on, on the need of the study, we can select the in vitro model that gives the best results here. So the skin is a barrier. And face it, um, the skin is designed by nature to keep substances and uh, xenophobics out of the human body. So what can we do to uh, overcome the skin barrier? And there are probably four uh, groups of um, tools that you can select. First is the thermodynamic, and that's probably most often applied. Um, you can either have oversaturated system. Um, they give you the best performance in terms of skin flux. However, they lack long-term stability because an oversaturated system always has a tendency to crystallize. And once you see the crystallization, well, then you have that uh, oversaturated system, uh, situation no longer existing, meaning that your, your flux will decrease. 
Now, there's one special way to overcome that, and I already mentioned that in situ activation uh, by using special uh, formulation. So, for example, you can use the moisture from the skin to activate um, the API in the formulation to generate that uh, oversaturated situation while the patch is worn and not during stability, not during shelf life. Excuse me. Then we have the chemical means of um, enhancement, and that is, of course, permeation enhancers uh, at utmost importance. And very often also discussed in the literature the use of liposomes. Currently, we don't use liposomes in, in our formulations because they have uh, failed to demonstrate uh, sufficient stability. But, of course, it is a way to overcome the skin barrier. Mechanically, uh, first, the sonorophoresis using ultrasound, which is um, a well-known feature in the academic. Um, to my knowledge, no system is on the market commercially utilizing this technology. And in the last couple of years, the microneedles have um, generated an increasing, um, increasing amount of work um, to mechanically overcome the skin barrier. And I'm quite sure that we will see a lot of products coming from, from that technology in the near future. And last but not least, there's also the, the option of using electrical current, uh, so-called ionophoresis. That technology has been around for almost 10 years, or even maybe more than 10 years. However, the early systems generated in the late 90s uh, had a lack of uh, stability because the uh, corrosion of the electrodes was something that uh, was really hard to get under control. Very recently, RDS and um, its partner has successfully uh, registered and approved an antiphoretic patch that overcome, overcame that um, uh, hurdle of uh, stability. Uh, so we do now see a commercially uh, available antiphoresis product in the market, and that again may spark further development in the future. So, when we go into the TTS success stories, I've picked uh, three examples um, to share with you. And before we go into this uh, in, in more detail, uh, I was will give you uh, a quick overview on the global market potential for transdermal. And then we take a look into the, our new pro formulation uh, with the improved bioavailability. We uh, share with you some information on the TransTech opportunity uh, that has opened new therapeutic fields for a well-known API. And last but not least, um, the Exelon as an example where the TTS really has outperformed all other dosage forms. But first, uh, I have to hand over to Iris uh, for the market numbers. There are numerous transdermal delivery systems currently available on the market. However, the transdermal market still remain, may, remains limited to a rather narrow range of drugs. In 2013, the pharmaceutical industry reported sales of approximately, approximately 4.35 billion euros for various TTS products. Compared to the total pharmaceutical market with estimated annual sales of 730 billion euros, it is still a niche with a share of about 0.6%. Okay, so first uh, case study I uh, would like to share with you today is a new pool. And that is the first API that came to the market only as a TTS. So very early in the development it was realized that uh, for Rotigotin, which is the API, uh, the oral bioavailability, um, the oral bioavailability is so poor that um, an oral dosage form cannot be developed. So the challenge here was to overcome that poor bioavailability with the oral administration by using um, a TTS. So that really is the solution. And on the next slide, uh, you can you can see some of the uh, milestones that we have here. So the product, the, the, the development really started back in 1998 uh, with the proof of concept data becoming available and the collaboration agreement 
signed between uh, RTS and Schwarz Pharma, that now is uh, UCB. Uh, and only six years later, and I would uh, really like to emphasize the point only six years later, because we talk about not only the full-blown pharmaceutical development, but also uh, the full-blown clinical development for very challenging uh, indication like Parkinson's. So uh, six years later, product was submitted to EMA, and within two years, uh, we obtained approval by EMA, and two years later, uh, approval by FDA, and even only four years later, approval from Japan was followed. So this product now is really a truly uh, global product. Let's have a look at the sales figures. In early 2014, UCB reported that more than 229,000 patients were provided with new prescriptions in 41 countries. In 2013, the sales of Nupro reached 274 million US dollars, having a compound annual growth rate of 20, 22% over five years. Okay, the second uh, study I'd like to share with you is the North Band Transtech opportunity. So it's really subtitled here, TTS leads to new therapeutic fields. What does it mean? Okay, this TTS is using buprenorphine. Buprenorphine as an API has been around for quite some time, used in anesthesia uh, as, a, as an injection. Um, however, uh, here we look, look into a product that is indicated for mild, severe chronic pain, like osteoarthritis. And the challenge here that we have, and, and certainly we have an abuse potential, and difficult handling of parental dosage forms. So that's nothing you can really give to the patient for home use. Um, the solution is, yes, the TTS reduces the abuse potential. Uh, although you cannot completely eliminate the abuse potential, it's much harder to extract um, API from a transdermal patch than from an uh, uh, from injectable solution. And the TTS enables very constant plasma levels and a longer duration. And here we have an action of up to seven days. And we also see uh, significantly reduced side effects here. Again, some numbers on the history. The development started back in 95 with the agreement between uh, LTS and uh, partners Grünenthal for Europe and Purdue Pharma for the US. And only four years we, later, we gained first approval by B Farm in Germany uh, as the first European country. The FDA approval process took, took longer because there were a number of concerns, uh, concerns raised by FDA in terms of safety of the product, but all of those questions could be answered eventually. So in 2010, the product was approved by FDA, and only one year later was also approved in Japan. Uh, and again, we now see a truly global product here. Let's see, have a look also at the sales figures. Um, in 2013, the combined sales of Northbound and Transtec exceeded 500 million US dollars. The products are currently available in more than 50 countries. The compound annual growth rate over the last five years is more than 15%. All right, and here comes my favorite case study, uh, the Exelon. Why is the favorite? Well, subtitles, the TTS outperforms the oral delivery form, and that's what it really does, and uh, EOS will show you the numbers later on. But first, have a look in the product. It's treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Um, the active uh, substance is rivastigmine, and I noticed from uh, the list of participants, and there are a couple of um, competitors in the, on the attendees, and Maybe some of them are also working on this um, product because it's a very successful product. The challenge here is that we have a pharmacokinetic profile uh, that gave serious side effects when administered early, uh, and that was mainly vomiting, nausea and vomiting, um, and that has led to a large number of people discontinuing treatment. And CDS offers constant plasma levels and thereby uh, was leading to an enormous 
reduction of those side effects. So the history behind, well, development started in 1992, uh, and now it took us about uh, eight years before the oral reversitic mean was uh, approved by FDA, and even seven more years before the TTS was approved by both EMA and FDA. So this time you may argue, well, this is 15 years of development. That's kind of slow. True, but on the other hand, uh, the TTS development was not driven with the, um, with the first priority because focus was given to the oral dosage form as it was believed that the TTS would only be uh, a line extension to the oral form. Um, in 2011, again, in my mind relatively quickly, the approval in Japan was obtained, so we do have uh, a truly global product now. I have to agree to, to Peter, this is really a special story for TTS development. The total Exxon sales in 2013 were reported with more than 1 billion US dollars. The compound annual growth rate over the last five years is around 8%. The overwhelming majority of sales, namely 92%, was achieved by the Exelon patch. In Europe, generic competition started very recently. The impact on sales figures of the Exelon patch will have to be awaited. So you can see it was, was a long time development, but um, because uh, priority was given to the to the old dosage form. So the message I'd like to send to the to the auditorium here is that you should consider TTS as first line. Um, treatment even very early in the, in the development. Okay, it's time for the quick poll, and uh, I'd like to hand over to Rachel for that. Thank you very much, Peter. So, for your next poll question, is there an API within your company's portfolio which you could potentially consider delivering through a TTS? And the answers are from A, yes, B, no, or C, I don't know. Please submit your answers now. So what are you expecting from this question, Peter and Iris? <laughs> we hope that there's a large number of people uh, clicking on yes or don't know, because if they, if they know it's suitable, they should contact us. And if they don't know, they should contact us too. But uh, let's see. Okay, then well, let's find out. Oh, so it's a range. Um, are these interesting results for you? Yeah, I guess I mean, we, we talk about 80% of people that either uh, know they have a compound or, or are not sure, and um, so there's plenty of, um, of opportunity for us to follow um, after that uh, webinar. So I, I think it's an excellent, excellent result. I like that. Oh, Peter, the summary. The summary, yeah. So in the past uh, about uh, 38 minutes or so, um, I shared with you, uh, Eric shared with you, uh, some figures on the market overview. We talked about TTS benefits, both from a pharmacological point of view, but also from a patient's point of view. Um, we talked a lot about TTS technology, and I showed you the large number of different designs that can be, can be uh, produced commercially, depending on what your API uh, really needs. And then we talked uh, intensively about our drug substance evaluation system. So how does RTS uh, work with you as a partner in order to evaluate the suitability of a specific API? And last but not least, we've covered some of the success stories that in our mind should demonstrate how, um, how suitable that dosage form really is in order to generate also commercial success. So often, very often we are asked, how do we see the future? Because transdermal delivery has been around since the late 70s. Well, currently we see that we have commercial products um, with, at LTS with uh, 12 APIs for the various partners, and there are additional active substance as potential TTS candidates. Looking into the large number of APIs that are out there, about seven or 8,000, that seems to be a low number, yet still the number is growing. 
So I don't think that the technology has really reached its peak yet. But there are new technologies. Um, what I would call the third generation system, like the active compounds, the active systems, ionophoresic, they offer new opportunities. We can deliver much larger molecules, much quicker and a much higher rate than with passive systems. And although they possess certain challenges in the development, they offer a complete new field. And I'm sure we see more of those in the next uh, years emerging from development. And then, uh, maybe in, in, the, in the time frame of three to five years, we will see what I would call a fourth generation system, uh, mainly from the microneedle, but also from electroporation, that paving the way for macromolecules and vaccine de technology that we today cannot uh, make available with transdermal systems. So with that slide, I'd like to share with you our vision on, on transdermal systems, and that is that we have transdermal systems are accepted and preferred first choice drug delivery systems, the seamless integration of TTS advantages into processes for identifying and optimizing lead compounds within state-of-the-art R&D activities allows transdermal patches to overcome the pharmaceutical barriers inherent in all the administered drugs. And that's what we are here for. We are here for to help our partners to exactly make that vision become true. So with that, I um, think it's time for time to thank you for your attention, time to thank you for the time you've spent, and we can now open the question and answer session and uh, hand over to Rachel for that. Thank you very much, Peter. So yes, it is now time for the question and answer section. So thank you to everyone who has already sent their questions in. Please continue to send in your questions by the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen, or please use the top left hand box. We will try and get through as many questions as possible. However, if we, if we do not have time to answer them all in this webinar, then Peter and Iris will get back to you at a later date. So for your first question, what kind of API is suitable for transdermal patch formulation? Well, there's a list of parameters that makes a compound suitable. Uh, the utmost importance is the size of the molecule. Uh, there are different numbers discussed in the literature. Um, the highest molecular weight that we currently have commercially available is around 480 Daltons. That's really at the upper end. And generally, you could say the lower the number, the better the compound is. The second important parameter is the log P. So that means the balance between hydrophilic and uh, lipophilic properties. And of course, at the end of the day, everything comes down to the dose. Because when you look at extra dial, for example, it may not be very favorable from the physical chemical param uh, parameters, but you only need so few micrograms of extra dial, so that still is a commercially available and commercially successfully available product. So I would suggest that if you, do, if you are in doubt with that, just contact LTS and uh, we, can, we can check on the parameters and we can make a good uh, estimation on that. Thank you very much. And what percentage of API is left on the TTS once its patient life is over? Yeah, that's a very difficult question. Um, in general, the yield is never 100% um, because we talk about diffusion processes, either passive or active. And that means at the end of the delivery, there will be some, some substance less. And in the commercially available systems, numbers go from uh, maybe 80% that's left in the product, with the, like with the hormones, uh, down to 20% that we do see in, in our center new patch. Um, so, but most products probably range somewhere in the 50% uh, area. Thank you very much. And for how many days is the Exelon patch? It's, it's a one-day patch. Exelon, Exelon is a once-a-day patch. Which I think maybe answers the next question. The next question was, does FDA approve seven days patch? Oh, yeah, several. Uh, the the, the, the Transtrack uh, is a seven-day patch. 
but there are also several uh, hormone patches. There are also birth control patches uh, available that are used for, for seven days. The FDA doesn't have a problem with seven days. You need to demonstrate that the product is safe and efficacious, um, and then you can have it approved. Thank you very much. And does your company have a financial program to co-develop a drug with another pharmaceutical company? I wouldn't call it a financial program, but maybe that is something that goes more to marketing. I would think that generally LTS is open to any sort of uh, business corporation, and uh, we should not exclude anything. So please, if you have any specific requests, just uh, get in touch with us, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we can work out a solution here. Yes, agree. Thank you very much. And are steroids feasible for TTS delivery? Yeah, definitely they are. Um, there are several um, hormone patches available. Uh, most common is the estradiol patch. Um, and also there are patches for birth control containing synthetic uh, estradiol. And there are also testosterone patches available. Um, it's not the steroid base uh, structure. It more comes down to the side groups um, that make the uh, steroid either feasible or not feasible. So you, you, can, you cannot say in general yes or in general no. There are some steroids that are available uh, and some that, that won't be. Thank you very much. And is it possible to modify existing TTS products from three days application to one day? <laughs> I, I'm, that, that, that's something that really maybe goes down more to a marketing question, also a clinical question. Um, it's probably also something you need to design from a, from a clinical point of view. Um, we have seen those requests, uh, especially from Japan, because in Japan, the more than one day patches um, are not that highly valued as they are in Europe and the US, um, because in Japan, people like to have a fresh patch every day. And one would probably like to reduce the, the amount of API in the patch by maybe applying a thinner coating in order to have less drug in the, in the product. But generally speaking, yes, it's probably easier to go from a three-day patch to a one-day patch than vice versa, but yeah, it, it's certainly something that can be done. Thank you very much. And what is the best type of adhesive for TTS system? <laughs> I, I would think the best one is that, that, that the best adhesive is the one that does the job, that delivers the right amount of API and that sticks to the skin for the, uh, for the desired amount of time and that doesn't cause any adverse skin re uh, reaction. So when you look into the products that are on the market, you find everything from polyisobutylene uh, to acrylates, SIS, and also silicones, and I would believe that every adhesive had certain pros and cons, and you need to pick the one that's best for, for the product. Thank you very much. And your next question, um, how transdermal are APIs in a topical preparation cream or pint or gel, etc.? You, you mean um, if, our, if our assessment tool is also suitable for creams and ointments, uh, fairly speaking, I don't know because our dosage form really is transdermal, so all the, the tools we have um, are focused on the transdermal route, and I would not know how those tools would really perform on, on creams and ointments because we, we don't manufacture those. So, frankly speaking, I don't know. I cannot answer. Okay, thank you very much. And what are the typical differences in shelf life of a TTS when compared to its oral dose equivalent? Yeah, well, to be fair, um, TTS are more, more challenging on the shelf life perspective. And from a commercial perspective, we know that anything less than two years is probably difficult because um, then the supply chain becomes very difficult. 
at the high end, we see products with we do see products with five years shelf life, but it, it's it's an exception. So I would think that most products are either 24 months or 36 months shelf life. Thank you very much. And can you briefly review what chemical characteristics are most suitable? Yes, uh, we, we, uh, as we said, molecular weight, the melting point, um, the log P, um, those are the ones that are most relevant. Then there are secondary parameters like the number of conjugated rings and how the molecule can be twisted, um, those ones. But the outmost, um, or one of the outmost important parameters also is the dose. Because whatever we do, um, the amount of substance that can be delivered to the skin is kind of limited. And uh, it will only remain um, in the lower milligram region. Um, so something like 100 or 200 milligrams is something you cannot deliver transdermally. So you need to have a potent drug. Thank you very much. And do you foresee TTS products for OTC use? Oh, yeah, definitely. They are. I mean, uh, for example, the nicotine patches are OTC in Europe. Um, I believe there are also some in the U.S. Um, there, are, there are also some, I'm just thinking, no, the hormone products are, of course, all RX. Uh, Exelon, of course, RX, the new pro is RX, all the painkillers RX. Um, yeah, it's probably the nicotine. And uh, yeah, there are some, there are some, some non-pharmaceutical products, uh, also some cosmetic products. But I would think the majority is RX. There are some that are OTC. Thank you very much. And how does the stability of drug in a TTX matrix compare to oral formulations? In general, more challenging. Um, the, the simple reason, the, the, the molecule can move rather freely in the TTS formulation. So with that regard, it's, it's more similar to a solution. And being... Um, being available to movement, it's also available to chemical reaction, so it's it's uh, it's less stable as such. But of course, there are different means of um, stabilizing a molecule, starting from antioxidant until uh, preservatives, maintaining pH control, um, and and also other uh, techniques that uh, I don't want to disclose in too much detail. Um, but in general. Yes, it is one of the parameters that is key in the, in the development phase. You do need to uh, develop a, a stable product. Thank you very much. And what are the fundamental technological limitations of TTS that hamper the delivery of macromolecules? Yeah, the, it's the size of the molecule. The skin is really designed to keep um, xenobiotics out of the body. And the skin does that perfectly well, and only very small molecules can um, can navigate their way through the skin barrier. And it's only by things like microneedles that gives the way to macromolecules. Um, if we don't open the skin mechanically, I would think that we would not be able to deliver um, large molecules through the skin. We know that we can deliver large molecules like peptides to the buccal mucosa. That's possible, but buccal mucosa is also not a, such a uh, tight barrier uh, compared to the human skin. Thank you very much. And it sounds like biologics are still beyond transdermal delivery's reach. Yes. Um, clear, yes, it is. Uh, today it is. Um, I think we need to, we really need to uh, focus on technologies like microneedles or electroporation um, to, to make possible macromolecules. But it is, it is within the reach of the patch technology. It's just probably beyond the reach of passive diffusion technology. Thank you very much. And what other excipients or 
inactive ingredients are typically used in TTS patches? Yeah, the, the, the main part is, of course, the adhesive, as that serves several aspects. First and most important, of course, it needs to uh, attach the product um, safely to the skin, and that's, of course, important. If, if the patch doesn't stick, then it won't deliver. And secondly, it needs to keep the, the API dissolved and also must relieve the, the API to the skin. Um, the second most important uh, excipients are probably um, things like uh, um, uh, permeation enhancer and third most important stabilizers like um, um, pH control and, and, and antioxidant and these type of things. And then, of course, which is also considered an excipient, the backing film and also the release liner, both plastic films, are important uh, features of the product. Thank you very much. And are there differences in drug transport rates across the skin depending on the age group of the patient? No, I would think there's no general uh, term of age. Um, in the literature, we have seen several studies uh, discussing both age, gender um, of, and, and of the, of the um, patients, and there was no conclusive decision uh, on, on age, gender, or also the, uh, the ethnic uh, component uh, on the delivery. But there is there are different parts of the skin that are more permeable, like behind the ear, and there is a product for uh, use behind the ear, which is a scopolamine patch for motion, uh, motion sickness treatment, and that's to be used behind the ear. That area is very permeable. Uh, the male scrotum is very permeable. And most products are directed to be placed on either the arm, the upper body, uh, the back, or the side. Um, and you want, may want to use um, uh, an area of the body where you have very few, uh, uh, very few, or maybe even no hair, because the hair will, of course, uh, hurt when you remove the patch. Thank you very much. And does LTS have interest in developing a smart patch that would act? both as a biosensor and delivery device to measure bioanalytics and deliver the drug when needed? Of course, we are always interested in new technologies, and we think that smart patches will be or will have a future. Um, so, yes, of course. Thank you very much. And then for your last question, um, what is SIS? <laughs> I, I, I noticed that um, I'm using too many abbreviations. I'm sorry for that. Um, these are st styrene isoprene block uh, copolymers, so a specific type of adhesive that is not used very often, but if it does, it provides some unique properties. It's also known to be very skin-friendly, uh, so it's, an, it's, a, it's basically synthetic rubber. Thank you very much. And sadly, that is all we have time for. Um, if we did not get around to answering your question, then Peter or Iris will get back to you at a later date. So that just leaves me to thank Peter and Iris for what was a great presentation, and thanks to LTS Lohman Therapy Systems for sponsoring this session. To the attendees, you'll receive an email shortly telling you how you can access the on-demand version of this webinar or you can access this through our website, which is www.businessreviewwebinars.com. We look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so please do keep an eye out on the website just mentioned and follow us on Twitter, which is at BRWebinars for daily updates, and join our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars. So thank you once again, and I hope you all have a nice day.